now remember, we left off last time finishing chapter 2, and I asked you to look into chapter 3. And mainly I asked the women to do this because that's where it starts from, talking to you guys. And it's uh, one of those chapters in Scripture that, uh, depending on how you take it, can either be good or bad. And so for the person teaching on this chapter, it's going to be either good or bad. <laughs> Just remember, I didn't write it. <laughs> but I'm called to teach it. Before we start into chapter 3, I want to do a review of the last part of chapter 2. Because chapter 2 sets the stage for helping you understand the message that Peter gives to husbands and wives in chapter 3. Because without the submission that comes in chapter 2, all this that you're going to read here means nothing. Absolutely nothing. So open your Bibles to 1 Peter. Now let's look at the last few verses of chapter 2. This probably still new. We're going to start chapter 2, verse 11, and I'm just going to read it for you because we already went over this. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against what? Soul. The soul. Okay, you guys should know what those fleshly lusts are. It's the difference between walking in the flesh or living in the spirit, between being a carnal person or a spiritual person. Is there really such a thing as a carnal Christian? I'll leave that up to you. Because Paul says that the carnal mind leads to death. Christ leads to life. Okay? So verse 12, Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, and when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Peter is making a point here. He says, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You are free, in verse 15, 16, as free yet not using your freedom or liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. It's another word for that bond servant. Slave. Your mic's on mute. <laughs> there. Oh there we go. Okay, how's that? <laughs> Verse 17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable if because of conscience towards God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer and you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. He who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, he did not revile in return, and when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges right righteously. He committed himself to his Father. Verse 24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the foundation that is set for what's coming next, right? That foundation is submission. That you have to submit your life to God. And in the process of submitting your life to God, you're called to submit to the governing authorities. Is that right? Yes. You're called to submit to, if you have 
a boss that is just a tyrant, God has called you to submit to him, right? And his authority. Moving on from there to here, you have to understand what submission is and why it's important to God. If God tells you, what good is it if you're beaten for your faults and you take that patiently? What does that profit anything? You deserve to be beaten. But God says, what profits you is when you suffer and you've done nothing wrong and you take that patiently. Because that is the character of Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is who you're called to be like. And so, I asked you, ladies, why do you think it always starts with the women? Look, everywhere where Peter, Paul, Paul says a lot, and gives a lot of counsel to families, to husbands and wives, but the majority of the time, the vast majority of the time, who does he start with? Why? God started there. By nature, we're a more submissive and dependent person. Can you say that one more time? By nature, we're more dependent person and more submissive. Okay. Now, that's default. Technical difficulties here. Now, I have met some women that definitely were not uh, dependent nor naturally submissive. So, again, you have to answer these questions, ladies, yourself. Okay? Because either you're going to come to the conclusion that God does not like women, that He just wants to keep you down, and that this was a book written by men, for men, again, to keep women down, or you start to understand that this is an injunction from God Himself, and He has a reason for it. Now, don't worry, ladies, I'm not just going to pick on you, because the Bible doesn't just say wives or women. It always goes into the husband after that, right? And here's the thing about when the Bible calls the wife to submission. That part of submission is only called for when the husband is submitting himself fully to Christ and is willing to give his life for his wife the way Christ gave his life for his church. Do you guys understand that? Men, that is the basis of the submission that your wife is to give you. If you haven't submitted to Christ, she is not to submit to you. And you both are outside of the will of God. You understand that? Submission is a two-way street that if you want your wife to submit to you, gentlemen, then you better be submitted to Jesus Christ. The Bible tells the men over and over and over again to love their wives the way Christ loved the church. To be willing to give of yourself unselfishly for your wives. And if your wife don't see that in you, then how do you expect her to submit to you? Now, in this day, in this age, there are many families where the husband takes no part in the spiritual uh, responsibilities of a household. Right? Is that true, ladies? Yeah. So what do you do then? Especially if you're raising children. So if the husband is not taking his <coughs> responsibilities seriously, then what becomes your responsibility? Your responsibility is to those children and their welfare. Is that right? So when God calls you to submission, He's calling you to a godly submission. And that is by the guidelines that He sets up. The funniest thing that I get to deal with is dealing with uh, 
like 17 to 25 year old guys. I would rather not deal with 17 to 23 year old girls because their brains just don't work the way I can understand it. <laughs> well, my wife is 58 and I still don't understand this. <laughs> but see, the guys at that age, they like the submission part. And, and uh, they really like to enforce that part. Girls at that age, they, they don't want no part of that. So how do you get a young couple to actually understand why the Bible says for wives to submit to their husbands. It has to be modeled for them. It has to be shown them. If they didn't see that from their parents, how are they going to see and know how to act that way? It can be done. It's not impossible. But now you start to understand where we have made our mistakes and where our mistakes have passed on to the next generation. Biblical submission starts, number one, with each individual submitting themselves to God. And when you have submitted yourself to God in Christ, then you can start to better understand and live out why God calls you to submit to each other. Let me ask you a question. In the beginning, when you go to Genesis chapter 1, and into chapter 2, before you get to chapter 3, when God creates Adam and Eve, was there going to be one dominant over the other? No. no. When did that dominance come in? Yeah. After chapter 3, with the sin part, right? Yeah. So men and women always understand this. That God's original plan was that men and women were to be equal, co-partners together. God created Adam, saw that he was walking around the garden by himself, and what did God say? It is not good for the man to be alone. And any mother who has raised boys knows it is not good for little boys to be left alone. And you can take that to teenagers and you can take that to grown men. Sometimes it's not good for them to be alone and unsupervised. <laughs> so God said, Adam needs a helpmate. Now, think about this. Why did Adam need a helpmate? He was lonely, all the other animals had a mate. Yeah. What was the purpose of God created man and women and having a family? To populate the earth, right? And so it would be the family unit that would be able to show the offspring in future generations who and what God is like. Is that right? And if God only had a man, he would only show one side of the aspect and the character of God. Right? And so God looked and said, Adam is not whole. Nor can Adam truly represent me. Adam needs a helpmate. And that helpmate was Eve. Now, even in our age, in 2014, almost 2015, is there a difference between men and women? Or are we both the same? Huge difference. I would agree with that. <coughs> you ask any guy by himself if they understand women. And you ask any woman if they truly, fully understand how a guy thinks, why he does what he does. <laughs> they, you know. But it takes both to represent a total picture of God. When God created Adam, did he create him with a specific purpose in mind? Yes. So Adam had a specific role he was supposed to play. And every man that would come after 
Adam would have that same specific role he was to play. Same with Eve. So there is a difference in who we are, how we think, and how we live in our world. And God has laid down these guidelines for us. Once you get to chapter 3, everything's changed. When God created Adam and Eve, they were supposed to be partners together, helpmate. Where did God take the bone to make Eve? From the rib, not the toe and not the head. From the side, equal. When sin came, what was it that changed in the man and the woman? There's one thing that changed. Their nature, right? They went from having a selfless, God-like nature, God-like as in the character of God, you understand that, right? To a selfish, Satan-like nature. Right? And now, because of that, there's always this battle between men and women for the superiority. Who will be in charge? Who will have the final decision? Do you think God understood this before He even made them? Let me ask you a question. Did their fall take God by surprise? No. Do you believe that? Yep. Women, do you believe that? Because if you believe that, then you have to understand that God had a reason to write these things. <coughs> and then God had a reason for writing these things. If you've lived with a man long enough, you understand that he can love you one minute and he can hate you the next. If you live with a woman long enough, that could be a second. But the next second, she can love you again. Give her chocolate, she'll love you forever. <laughs> Tell me about that either. <laughs> I'm trying. <coughs> when the fall came, it did not take God by surprise. And so God made provision for it. And in His Word, He gives us counsel on the best way for us <coughs> to live together. Now let me ask you a question. When God joined Adam and Eve in holy matrimony, did he tell them it was just until they couldn't stand each other and then they could leave? Or until she found somebody better or he found somebody better? When God joined them together, it was forever. Till death do them part. And in our day and age today, we say we'll be married until something better comes along. Or until this just doesn't work out anymore. Right? That's our day and age. So again, once you stray away from what God has instituted, look at where society is today. Has liberal divorce laws helped this nation? Has liberal divorce laws helped this world? Has it helped the family? Look at the generation after generation after generation of messed up children who have children themselves and have messed up children. Who have messed up children? And my generation looks back on my mother's generation and their generation and says, see, but you guys stayed together no matter what it took and you hated each other. We didn't want that. So, yours didn't work out either. Because their generation didn't follow the biblical injunction either. And that was, if you submit yourself to Christ and you love Him, then you will love your spouse. Because that's what God calls you for. But if that selfish nature takes over, then you will treat each other selfishly. If you don't meet my need, I'm not going to meet your need. If you don't do what I want that pleases me, I'm not going to do what you want that pleases you. And then it becomes a war and a battle. <coughs> so, I tell you all this to get into this part here. To lay a foundation. To help you realize that you have to come to the conclusion of, did God write this for a purpose? For your benefits? Or is it wrong? So, 
Verse 1 says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the con conversation of the wives. What is that telling you? That's telling you that back in Peter's day when he wrote this, there were believers and unbelievers who were married together. Okay? And there wasn't too much of a difference in his day. The women would accept Christ quicker than the men. Okay? In our church today, look around, women usually outnumber the gods. And it's pretty much always been that way. When Jesus had his followers, it talks, bless you, it talks about the 12 men, but it also mentions all the women that followed him. And it was the women that ministered to him and their needs. Is that right? So there was a lot of ladies there. If the women submit themselves to Christ and submit themselves to their husbands, they can win their husbands because their husbands are able to see Christ through them. Now, I would tell you today that this also applies to the husband. If the husband is in a marriage relationship with an unbelieving wife, then she should be able to see Christ through you. And because of your submission to Him, she may be one to the faith. Right? Does that make sense to you guys? This is the word that Peter writes. Verse 2. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Let's look at this verse because uh, I want to go through this. When they observe your chaste conduct, and the New King James has a supplied word that's accompanied, accompanied by fear. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, what does that word fear mean to you? Should you be afraid of your husband? That's right. It's the same fear that you are to give God. Do you obey God because you're afraid he's going to hurt you? No, you obey God because you love Him. And God deserves our respect and our fear. Okay? Now, how many of you, when you were growing up, or even in your jobs, were afraid to upset your parents or your boss? Not because you were afraid that they would throw a fit or fire you, but you did not want to... Uh, look bad in their eyes. You didn't want to disappoint them. Okay, I didn't want to disappoint my mother. So I had a fear of not disappointing her. It wasn't that I was afraid of what she would do to me. It was <coughs> that fear of seeing that disappointment. It's the same thing with God. I don't want to disappoint Him either. So when you look at this verse, some families are ruled by fear. And it's not that kind of fear. It is a fear of, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to hurt you. You better listen to me, and you better fear me. That's not what God is talking about. And unfortunately, brothers and sisters, that's the kind of fear that rules a lot of Christian households. Even within the Adventist church. Don't kid yourself. Abuse happens everywhere. And it's something that the church... What's that? And it is the church's responsibility to stand up against that, wherever it happens, and whoever it is that's perpetrating those actions. Because a lot of times in the church, you will find those in the highest positions have that kind of relationship inside their families. And it is the dirty little secret that never gets talked about. The church is very uncomfortable stepping on that ground. And I'm here to tell you that that will not happen here. The leaders in this church, you have a responsibility to protect your flock. The leaders in this church, if this is how you're running your household, and I find that out, we will definitely be having a discussion. Anybody that's a member of this church, if I find out that you are abusing anybody in your family, I will get the authorities involved, because that is my job. Amen. Amen. Not just men. Oh, no! 
But the majority of the time it is men. Right. 